keeps telling me how my story is supposed to go. Nah, I'm gonna do my own thing. Hey everyone, Rascal here. And Mama, welcome to our channel, Pause and Animation, and another Superhero Month podcast. Yes, and today we're doing another Spider-Verse video, not the sequels out on digital and DVD, so you can see it on any platform. Yes, and we're going to compare both films and even discover some hidden Easter eggs and theories, courtesy of Rascal family member, Playmaker! Yay! Yeah. But, yeah. before we start... Yes. Before we start, be sure to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell to some future podcasts from all the pause videos. Absolutely. Now, we did one podcast prior on Across the Spider-Verse itself, and if you haven't seen that, you might want to check that out. This is something totally different. Right. So, Rascal, bring us up to speed on what we're doing today. Okay. So, this is a comparison of the first two movies in the Spider-Verse trilogy, there is a third movie called Beyond the Spider-Verse coming either next year or 2025. Uh, the first movie is called Spider-Man to the Spider-Verse, and it focuses on Miles Morales and a kind of sort of reimagining of how he becomes uh, having the mantle of Spider-Man and dealing with other Spider-People from different universes and how they create this Spider-Verse where anyone could wear the mask if they have uh, make the right decision and really want to be a hero. And then the second one, Across the Spider-Verse, uh, is a sequel to Into the Spider-Verse, the second one. And this one gets a little more heavy in their subject matter and topics. You have Miles now being Dub Spider-Man, this universe of Spider-Man, and now he's trying to balance his way of real life and being a superhero. And not only do you have another villain running around, but you also have Spider-Verse once again being in danger, and this my only effect just Miles, but his family, and just the, the every universe in general where every individual Spider-Man will be affected. And last but not least, Sylveon addressing the ship between Miles and Glenn. Yes! <laughs> right. So, which do you think is better? If you already have an answer, guys, let us know in the comments below. Okay. By and far, by like a, like a thousand mile headcanon there, Across the like it's across the Spider Verse. I'm sorry, it takes the cake on like which movie is better. Okay. The overall delivery of this movie is like it's just phenomenally better in the sense that like in the first one it's just trying to basically get Miles off his feet to like you know say oh I can't like the, the simple cliche of oh I can't do this you gotta do this maybe I can't do this okay now I've done this now I now I am the hero. Mm -hmm. But this this movie it's basically there's not just targets Miles in terms of what he's doing, but pretty much speaks to the whole audience about like what needs to be done, what's got to be done, and what should be done. So not just this sense, but like in every sense, especially when they get to the whole multiverse aspect of like what things are going to lead to next. Mm -hmm. Because this, that's where it really hits the, the deepest with not only the character, but also to the audience itself. Yeah, so, that's yeah. true. That's definitely true. I want to add quickly that both movies are blockbusters in theater, yes. making way more than it ever took to create them or right. budget it. And we had the return of the actors that weren't killed off in the first movie mm -hmm. to the second. Actually, they even returned in the second movie in, in terms of flashbacks. Right. And right. the production and animation went in a different direction, mm -hmm. and some areas even elevated beyond the first one. So I just yes. wanted to add that. Go ahead and let us know what you think. Yeah. Well, at first it was difficult because you know how much you love the first movie. And the second one really anticipated and it was over two hours, so even longer than the first movie. And they had a lot more characters in there. And as you said, things were really elevated. Stakes were higher and everything. I think probably because I love the first one so much, I think the first one's still my favorite. But maybe that'll change once we have the complete trilogy with the third one and we can compare all three movies. Okay. Alright. But can I also just throw in one thing here? Mm -hmm. One thing. Also, like, I know, like, with the, with, uh, the idea of the Spider-Verse and the idea, like, you know, every other Spider-Man coming in to fruition was, like, the point of the first one where it showed, like, the five different universes coming to Miles from the universe. Mm -hmm. Which is, like, one of the biggest things coming there, but... Honestly, like, the biggest thing of why I feel Into the Spider- uh, Across the Spider-Verse is better is because of one thing. Wow. Josh Keaton. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so obviously that was the like, design. So, I mean, obviously the idea of every Spider-Man existing in one place, uh, it, it was great enough. But the fact that Josh G came onto the movie, something I wanted for the first movie, yes, that, that entirely makes it better in my book. Okay. <laughs> so let me tell you my favorite and why, and then we'll get into a little more detail on the second movie, and then we'll jump into the hidden Easter eggs that Playmaker has for us and his fans. For me, both movies were great, but I have to say, I, I tend to be a purist, and for me, the first one far outshines the second one, not because it isn't good. I think for me, it's because it was so different when it came out. It was unlike anything we've ever seen, and it was, it hit all the buttons that you wanted to hit when you watch a movie. And it's so excellent that I don't know how many times that I watched that movie over. I, right. I haven't even counted. It's so great. The voice acting, casting was perfect. The animation was so fantastic that everyone and his mother has copied the style yes. since the movie came out. And it seems like in the second movie they kind of want to do something different. I personally wish they had stayed with what they created, but I'm not disappointed with what they did. Right. The songs in the first movie, oh my gosh, I like every, not like, I loved every single song that they played on the soundtrack. Right. It's like a perfect soundtrack. Right. I liked seeing the additional uh, Spider-Man from the different verses. Mm -hmm. I love seeing Spider-Noir. Yeah. I wish he had his own show. <laughs> I just think the first movie is absolute perfection. And regardless of how many movies they make after, even if they go with the fourth, after the third, or they have some spinoffs and so forth. Right, which we know is coming. It's the original, and it's going to be the best because it was a catalyst in Hollywood, in animation, in music. It was a catalyst for so many things that are happening now that never would have taken place or having been made because of Into the Spider-Verse. Right. So that's why it's my favorite. Right. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> quite a bit. Quite a bit. So, I, I love that we all have our own and we respect each other's opinions, and we don't think anyone's opinion is wrong. I want to say that to anyone listening. Why? And no one is right or wrong here. It's just how we see it and what we're thinking. But the bottom line is, this particular franchise is fantastic. It's unlike anything out there. Right. The third movie is probably going to even be more yeah. impressive than the first movie and the second movie. Why? Right. And there will be debate after the third one in which one is better, right. because that's just what people do. Right. But the franchise right. itself is fantastic, and there's no right or wrong answers here. It's just, this is what we love about it. Right. So, tell us about some hidden Easter eggs besides my Josh Keaton. Right. <laughs> okay, wow. So, shit, a lot, of, a lot of hidden Easter eggs, and a lot of, like, it's not just hidden Easter eggs, but plot holes that don't even make sense for the fact of what this movie was based off of. Now, remember in your first podcast, you said that the that the main thing about it, about Across the Spider-Verse was like basically that they knew they were in movies and cartoons and stuff like that, and that's why they come up with this whole canon events, canon meaning like what's, what's in a show, right. what's not in a show. Right. Right. Well, there are like the points that I found out here and the things that they've, that they've, that they've discussed in the show and in the movie don't really even add up to what they're even saying. Now, uh, but before I get into that, I just wanted to also answer a question that Josh Keaton, the actor of Spectacular Spider-Man himself, answered from one of your podcast questions where you asked, like, why are the other Spider-Men, you know, afraid of him? Why don't they stop him? Why don't they disagree with what Miguel said? Right, because they were hunting Miles along with him, and they were ready to take him out if necessary so the canon event could be canon, which didn't make sense because you not only would have his dad, but then you'd have a dead Spider-Man. Yeah, exactly. And it wasn't making right. any sense. Right. Exactly. Well, Josh Keaton actually pointed, like, when he was saying, giving his points on, I was watching him on Twitch a couple weeks ago, and uh, he said that the point that he made to why, the, the reasoning of why they would believe in him, or why even his own Spider-Man would believe in him, especially with the whole aspect of great power and great responsibility. Mm -hmm. Well, Spider-Man, like, uh, Josh Keaton says that he and Spider-Man would say, like, you know, the reason why he got his powers is so he can use it to help other people, because he didn't use it to help Uncle Ben, or, like, these other Spider-Men, not using it to help other people who just died. Right. Okay. So, 
Josh Jean said that with Miguel O'Hara coming from not only another dimension, but the future, and with, with Miguel coming with all this information saying that the can this is the candidate event, this was supposed to happen, it's happening to every one of them, mm -hmm. Josh Keaton explained that if that happened to the Spider-Man, it's a great tragedy, and with Miguel O'Hara coming to them, essentially comforting them with the fact that all this was supposed to happen, mm -hmm. they would essentially look to Miguel as something of a god. Wow. So, and that's, and that's the major thing about this, like, they always, they always try to say, like, oh, this is supposed to happen, oh, this is, oh, this is just what we should do as good guys, but I think that also is in part of why Miguel is so, so zealous in what in his whole mission is, the whole, like, trying to fix reality. I think this is all got to his head and making Miguel have kind of a god complex going on in his head. But he was also quite scarier than he is in the comics yeah it was, yeah like, it was like whoa because we own the spider quite a few of the spider 2099 comics including the first one and it was like what in the heck is going on i remember right. we were just yeah. stunned yeah yeah it, yeah it's it's also on that note like it's the, the fact that there are these other versions of me of, of these spider men and, and the character himself which is one which just doesn't make which just add up with some of these qualities in the movie Right. So I'm gonna get on to like the main point here. That across the Spider Verse challenges the idea and like, pretty much tries to change like Miguel himself tries to change the entire the entire well, the entire baseline of what Spider Man is supposed to be. He's supposed to be a hero who has power and he saves people because right. he didn't save the first one. Right. The whole concept of Spider Man is that he didn't save one in time because he chose not to. Now, especially with what Miguel Hero is trying to put into basically trying to change Spider-Man's story to I didn't save him in time to I won't save him in time. And that kind of lines up now that you're saying that it kind of lines up with a lot of the way that people think when it comes to anime and animation and different storylines. They kind of want the tragedy or look for the tragedy or expect the tragedy and they're disappointed when things work out and go well and they don't get the tragic tragedy or the tragic backstory. Why? Because before you... Oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. No, I was going to say, but on that note, it shows that, like, sometimes, like, when people are trying to stop what was really going to happen, it just still happens anyway. Like, that's a, kind of the point they were trying to make in Spider-Man No Way Home when they were trying to fix all the live-action Spider-Man villains, and some of them probably would have gone back to what they were doing, and some of them probably would have been cured, but still killed off anyways. Right. Like, it's, it's more like they're trying to get back to, on the reaction that they want because that's not what they know the fans want and that's what they know, like, is, is what's better. We've got a comment on that after you come. Okay. Well, that is a good point because there was a point where people would not like when characters got killed, especially ones that are beloved. And we know Disney... Like the death in the family. Right. And we know that Disney is notorious for them having one death every movie, usually a parent a sibling, a dog, or something. They gotta have one person be taken out. And for a while, people were like, can you please stop doing this? I'm tired of seeing this. It's always in every movie they didn't want to see anymore. But I think now they've gotten so assimilated to it after now 100 years of Disney, now it's like when there's no death in there, they're like, well, where is it? Where is the thing that makes me feel sorry for them? Like, we can't feel sorry for these characters unless they've gone through the most tragic thing possible and we need to cheer them on to get back up. Well, it doesn't have to happen every time. It doesn't have to be this extreme when that happens. It can be some other type of tragedy, but not to the point of oh, the death of somebody. I don't think that's really necessary for having the pity for a character or saying, well, they gotta lose somebody or else it's not right. One quick comment after that's that. Exactly what, I'm sorry. One quick that's comment. Exactly One quick comment. And then take it away. Okay. And okay. for me, the interesting thing is it's like they're saying the human experience is always negative. We never see where if you try to stop it, it's going to happen anyway. Happen in the positive. It's never something good is going to happen. And oh no, let's see if we can make something better. No, this is going to happen anyway. It's never in the positive. It's always in the negative. And I've yeah. always wondered why is it just always when bad things are going to happen, if you try to change it, they're going to happen anyway. It's never. Or get worse. If good things are going to happen, they're just going to happen even if you try to change it. There's never that attitude of storyline. Right. So, continue playmaker. <laughs> oh, 
So I, I, on that note, it's like the fact that you say that you know that whatever happens is gonna happen, or that's what or like where's the tragedy. I think that's like sort of the place that Gwen is gonna come came from at the end. Like remember when she had that epiphany when she realized that her dad quit being captain, so it's not Captain Stacy dying anymore, so right. it can't be a Captain Stacy to die. Right. Which is why we get some miles. Mm-hmm. I think that's like that was the place they were trying to do it. Like they're they're basically trying to say that just be like they're just gonna change like one not even. Not even big point about it. They're just gonna basically make it a technicality. Because I mean, while it is like you know, canon that like in most Spider-Man universes, Captain Stacy dies. It's not the fact that he's a captain that he that kills him, or it's not the fact that he's there or a police officer. It's just the fact that he's that character. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's the same thing with like, Miles' dad. I mean, like in like two other Spider-Man that I've seen, uh, Miles Morales' dad, Jefferson Davis, he dies, and, and I think in one of them he's not even a captain. He's just another you know big police officer who got who got commended. Yeah, we've so read right all of the so graphic right. novels and the so, spinoffs, too, in the comics. Right. So, yeah, that's true. Right. And so, yeah, it's on that. And then on that note, too, stemming from that, make, like, they completely ignore the fact that, like, with all these infinite amount of universes that Spider-Verse brings up, mm-hmm. the fact that there are multiple Peter Parkers, multiple Spider-Women and whatnot, mm-hmm. they didn't bring up the fact that, like, in the video games, in the, in the ultimate, like, in Ultimate Spider-Man, the 26th, 2017 Spider-Man, Spidey, Spidey has made his friend that there are other Gwen Stacy's, there are other Miles Morales's, and there are other Miguel O'Hara's. They make it seem like this movie's Miles, Gwen, and Miguel are the only ones, and yet they never brought them up. The fact that these that these guys are still existing even before Miles existed. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah that's true. And, 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 and especially with Miguel, like when you say like how like oh in the comics and in the cartoons and the video games, it's like he's more funny, he's more dramatic than what they show up here. He's all dark and broody. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, they're not, they're not, they're basically saying that this is the only guy, which is, what doesn't make sense in the fact that, like, oh, they all know they're in a movie, which means they exist. Oh, he's, but, he's beyond dark and broody. He's just violent yeah. and psychotic and anything which I guess, you can think of in here. He's the worst case of what Spider-Man could be. That's which, what it is yeah. for this version. Which, it works out perfectly for people because, just like anime, uh, crazy seems to be hot because everyone's simping for Miguel inside him wanting to kill these people. Oh, we want to ship with him. What? That's what we want with you people. That's what we want with you people. And you got a right to simp. We're going to say that. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Crush on who you want. We just don't get them. <laughs> right. And on that note, too. Like the other Spider Man, like they're, they're not talking about like the other Miles or the other Gwens or the other Miguels. Like that also doesn't make sense. Uh, it's Miguel, like, Miguel says that the reason why he hates Miles specifically is because like he, they say that he is the first anomaly. He's the first one that messed with like the law of like every dimension, which causes all these other anomalies. Mm-hmm. But then they're forgetting the fact that like there are so many other things that could have happened mm-hmm. or that weren't controlled by some by these anomalies specifically that did happen within the Spider Verse. Like, did you ever watch Spider uh, the Ultimate Spider Man, the one with uh with Dave with Dave Drake Bell? Uh, I think that's the only one we probably haven't seen. Yeah, and all we hear is people hated it, but we haven't seen it, so yeah. we have no idea how it is. It, it was pretty. It was pretty decent. Like, definitely better than 2016. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but the point is. In that show, they actually had a five, a five parts uh, special where they went through all the super different Spider Verses, where this guy met with all the other Spider Men, including Miles and, and Miguel. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and they're, and they're basically saying like, oh, that didn't do anything. They're not talking about this Spider Man Spider Verse because this happened a lot, a lot earlier. When exactly what they did in the, the Spider Verse movie happened there, where they go to different dimensions and they're trying to mess with something and nothing happened. No anomalies happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And the same thing with the, and the, another thing happened in the ninety in the ninety Spider Man uh, with the, the Amazing Spider Man nineteen ninety four mm-hmm. with the, the animated series. Mm-hmm. Okay, they, they they went to other dimensions. They they messed around with a lot of things and nothing apparently happened. Which is which is makes you wonder why didn't Miguel bring this up in the Spider Verse movie like they did with No Way Home with right. the little nerd from Earth ninety nine 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 nine. Yeah, it's right. kind of like they were just wanting you to focus on, as you mentioned, what they, they want you to focus on this and this story. This, this. And to pretend everything didn't exist, which is a conundrum, since you got every Spider-Verse and every universe and every version appearing in it, that kind of doesn't make sense. Exactly, because the, the video games are canon, the Lego games are canon, live action is canon because live action Prowler got captured, so even MCU's canon to this too. So... That was actually one of my points. 
Right. So, Ooh. right. So, it's kind of weird. They're going to say, okay, well, forget that show. This is the new rule. Right. Follow this one. Right. Ignore anyone else's version. This is the law we've created. Ignore the other ones. We're pretending it happened. <laughs> wow. And, and, that's, and that's the thing that I think Marvel is, is doing a lot. Like, the fact that they, they pretty much said, like, what time travel is supposed to mean. It's not go to the past, change the future. It's just creates a new future, creates a new timeline. Mm-hmm. Now, they're, they're saying that now it doesn't even create a new timeline. Now, they're saying that every decision makes a whole other freaking universe. So right. Time travel anymore. It's a dimension travel. So basically, Marvel has been Disney-fied in the sense they don't go with the laws of physics or science or theories or anything like that. It's like we're just... I'm sorry. We saw this. Uh, one person talk about this on YouTube, and he said it's like Marvel is lazy, and they don't want to come up with new stories, so now everything is a multiverse. Right. And that explains everything. And they don't have to make sense. Right. They just tell you, oh, it's the multiverse. That doesn't make sense. Oh, it's the multiverse. Yeah. And, yeah, you're not the first one to see that, and neither are we, that these these so-called postulates and theorems that they are coming up with in Marvel don't make any sense. Right. Right. And on that note, like, they don't even keep up with, like, I was trying to say this in the beginning earlier, too, that they don't even keep up with their own, like, with their own logic, especially mm-hmm. within this movie where you think about it with, uh, with Miles's, with um, Miles's Spider-Man's death, or or uh, with these other Spider-Men doing these other things that never should have been, like like saving loved ones or being with loved ones and whatnot, like those are apparently anomalies. Well, in that case, like why didn't it not, like why did anomalies start only when when Miles was bitten? Why didn't they start when that version of Peter Parker was never supposed to die? Yes, die? right. Or in that case, why did, why wasn't Spot the one affected by the whole you know anomaly thing? Well, why wasn't he right. one to blame when Miles didn't do anything? Yes, so right. Explosion. And we were saying that when we were yeah, watching it's it. Yeah, we were, Yeah, we were like, did they forget he exists? We were yelling at the screen, right. why? Why? Yeah. All right. And then on top of it, uh, sorry, to go as you were saying about can event doesn't necessarily be what he says it is because he also saved the captain in the Spider-Man India universe. Yes. He didn't die, and he turned out just fine. So it's like, okay, you got three anomalies going on, and nothing happens yeah. so why is it still important you need to get rid of miles it almost seemed yeah. to me quickly it almost seemed to me and you don't even get an explanation as to why it would be this way right that miguel had a hatred for miles and it was personal and it didn't make sense very right. right it's just still going for you and on that note which is kind of scary because like i know they don't like they basically said that like, you know miles becoming spider-man is the reason why it all well why it all came off so just because we didn't see it happening doesn't mean things are happening mm-hmm. does that mean also and that's like this also makes me wonder like why you know uh, peter b parker you know the one from into the spider-verse Mark, right. uh, miles mentor right it makes you wonder why that like now i think i figured out why that peter is also really close to miles unlike most of the others by the way you know runs or soldiers or whatnot mm-hmm. do you think that because of this that's peter's daughter mayday in that in that spider-man universe let's recap in that spider-man universe uh peter divorced divorced mj mm-hmm. and was living a sad life and didn't even he said he didn't want kids and then when he met when he met miles an entire anomaly thing he was motivated to go back with her and have that daughter now even though other spider-men have daughters and whatnot this they, they made it clear that this spider-man was supposed to be one where his life was just going in the gutter and then meeting miles an apparent anomaly made it go in the right direction so does that mean his daughter and this peter is now an anomaly that Miguel is gonna have to do away with eventually probably yeah if, it, if you're basing on what's happening in this movie and they don't change it in the next movie then yeah and they should see this coming if he's doing this with miles yeah they should see this coming that's yeah. what didn't make well, sense why well, they well, weren't well, getting that it wasn't gonna stop with Miles. Yeah. It was gonna keep going, and with whomever he thought shouldn't be in the equation, he wanted taken out. That that was obvious. This is not gonna stop at Miles if he is still yeah. the leader. It's not gonna stop. Right. Especially, if, especially like with Gwen, her dad quitting, quitting being captain. Like that's also a constant in every universe where like Gwen stays his dad as a police captain. Mm-hmm. So like, I think I think Miguel probably saw also saw this coming. Like the second that he knew, like the reason why he didn't even want her to go in because he knew that just messing with her timeline, messing with her universe was gonna cause you know backlash and everything in her universe. So I think Miguel was also gonna be prepared to take Gwen's universe out too. Oh yeah, because he was angry. 
Because he was angry because she she was going to go talk to Miles. He was pissed about that. Yeah. He didn't want that. And then the, what's the one, the pregnant spider woman? Spider, yeah, spider woman? Yeah. No, spider woman. Just do that. The fact that she was pregnant with a child and she knew these were, were kids, I mean teens, kids, and she sided with, ooh. It's with like the guy confusing. It's that like, why would she side with Spider Man 2099 knowing everything that was going on and she got so angry? Okay, we're gonna lock up Gwen and we're still gonna let him kill Miles. It was like, but you're pregnant and you have a child. What is wrong with you? In the right. beginning, you were like, oh, she's so cool. She's bad, eh? And then suddenly yeah. when she went there, it was like, you are no longer cool. I'm right. sorry. You were just cool. And, yeah, yeah, she, okay, that Spider Woman absolutely killed the movie. I thought she was going to be cool. I thought she was going to be an ally. But no, especially in the end where she's like, nope, you broke the rules. You've been, like, she didn't even do anything to stop I thought she was going to be like, Gwen, like just Gwen's mentor or something like how Peter was to her. But right. no, no, like this is Spider Woman. Was just went all, almost to be just as bad as Miguel. Now, who ended up being the coolest to me? Never expected it. Didn't know anything about him. Didn't expect to like him. Was Spider Punk? Right. When he says, "Just for the record, I'm out of here. I'm not with oh, this, yes. and I'm out of I here." I quit. And he was like, "You say he's supposed to be the rebel, right?" He's yeah. Right. After they all were, after he's for the record, I quit, and he just leaves. You know, I'm not even getting involved with this. Mm -hmm. So he that's, was. That's a big reason why I love. I like at the beginning, honestly, I hated Hobie because like, like mostly because of the same things I deal with, like you know, Starco and Tomko being like, oh man, he's trying to take away the main character's love, and like, oh no, like what? This guy. <laughs> right? It's like that, and then nothing like that happened in the movie. And you didn't expect to I like know, him. I know, I know. I can see the beginning when I first, you know, saw when and when and Hobie talking, like what? What's what's? Oh come on, don't don't this be another Tomko thing. Right? I think we'll turn it off. <laughs> and no. You realize that the entire time he was trying to help Miles and the other chips, he stole all that, he, he, he didn't notice it, but like all that equipment he was stealing, he was just building another new dimension on him. Yeah. So he ended up, yeah. I ended up liking him. Now, I'm glad you brought up the Tom and Marco, uh, I guess, similarity, because now we want you to go into the oh, theories yeah. you have for your Spider Marco and for versus oh, the forces of evil so we want to finish up this podcast on that because this could go on an hour we want to hear what you got for us and we hope you're all listening yeah all right so as i did so as many of you may or not may or not know like especially with my channel i especially make points about comparing marco diaz with the spider-man universe namely the toby Maguire and spectacular spider-man universes now I, I'm not just doing it because I think, oh, they're just two cool guys, but there are just way too many similarities, especially with, with the movies and with Spider-Verse and these other movies have brought up. They have basically confirmed one thing. With uh, with what No Way Home has brought up, saying that there are multiple universes out there, with what with what uh, Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness, saying that there's, like, somewhere out there, dreams are, like, other versions of other realities, and somewhere out there, those imaginations, those things are actually universes. And now, thanks to Spider-Verse, they're basically confirming that somewhere out there, Spider Marco, a universe where Marco Diaz was bitten by Spider with a top hat, exists. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Especially, especially when you think about the fact that what these, like, Marco Diaz, in terms of what, he, what he's been through and his character are exactly like Spectacular Spider Man. Like, I don't know if, you, if you've seen it before, like how Marco literally looks like Spectacular Spider Man's Peter in every way, just a different animation style with brown hair, slender look. Cute little mole. Right? <laughs> Cute little mole. Right? Yes. Because we own Spectacular Spider Man, so yes. Gwen Stacy just looks like Star without her iconic, like, you know, horn, horn headband, but she's still got a headband. She's still a blind character who is. Considerably attracted to the main character, and they don't even realize it until the very end. Right. Wow. That's true. Because even at one point where the they had a Spider-Man cartoon where he was looking so much like Marco, it was almost yeah. like if this wasn't the same company, you think it was copyright. <laughs> it's like Playmaker brought these things into existence with his Spider Marco character. It's like <laughs> the law of attraction made everything you're coming up with canon and right? valid. Right. <laughs> How we keep bringing up how like monsters like uh, the monster arm from Star Wars is basically just Venom, except he's not slime, he's his tentacle, it's just what Venom did. Yeah. And yeah. Then the relationship between Jeremy Birnbaum and, and, and 
Margo is just like Eddie Brock and and, and Peter. Yeah, which yeah. Is the, same, the same extent that like Venom tried to beat up Venom tried to beat up Eddie Brock, and then the Monster Arm tried to beat up Jeremy the same way. And that if he's, he was to sit he around, it. Monster Arm probably would have gotten to Jeremy just like how he did with Eddie Brock and Venom. He deserved it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know he, that's not the point. <laughs> wow. Okay. And then. And then, of course, like, just the obvious ones, like, you know, Mario beating a giant lizard or fighting a goblin, such as, like, similar stuff there. But then also, I did bring up this one point, like, in one of my movies that I don't know could happen, considering, you know, you know, Star's family and, you know, how Dimension Travel works. I did make this one suggestion that maybe, in a, in a way, like, when, when Queen Moon, when she was young, you know, like, her young, happy-go-lucky self, that maybe she did dimension hop and went to another version of Earth where she dyed her hair and became the other great Griffin character on Spectacular Spider-Man, Sally Orville. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, wow. so what I'm thinking is like that, that may, may have been Moon in disguise going to another universe and then, then that's what was Marco. Oh man, wow. that would be and that would which, be crazy. Yes. Which is also kind of weird in that sense when you think about like, you know, that in the beginning uh, uh, Peter Parker was, was, into, was into that great Griffin character at first. Yeah. And, then, and then you think, like, that's, Mo, that's Moon Star's mom, and you think, what does that say about our Marco? Right? It's like, yeah. yeah and you know, he's been shipped with everybody, <laughs> even the uh, uh, older characters, and they made him older, well, so. And also, you know, like, you know, in the show, they made, they basically said that Moon looked exactly like Star, just, you know, looking like that, and then she grew older. Right. So, yeah. You think maybe that would be. Also, in the sight sense, do you think maybe that's part of the reason why Star Wars with Marco? Why Marco's the star? Could be, now that we've, heard, we've heard, heard all of this, yeah. yeah. That sounds very feasible, it's definitely. feasible. It's definitely. So, yeah, that, that plus the fact that Pete, like, the, the spectacular is in the, that version, yeah. Oof. Oh, wow. Okay, didn't expect wow, any of that, right? Yeah. Oh, boy. So, yeah, like, the fact that all these, like, they do so many points with the spectacular Spider-Man and Tobey and Tobey Maguire's universe is comparing it to Marco, and here's the biggest reason why, why it could also work, and especially the spectacular. I learned, like, I posted this on YouTube, too, but Josh Keaton actually confirmed that if it wasn't for Adam MacArthur, he would have been the voice of Marco. That, oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember you showing a clip of that from the stream, and it's like, and it would have been yeah. an entirely different show. It would have been just something different. Right. But it plays yeah. into what you're saying, a Spider-Man voicing Marco. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And all and that working Marco into it. Marco being another Spider-Man. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, this, this is fascinating. Right. If you have, you guys listening have any Easter eggs or theories you want to add or let us know about let us know in the comments below so quickly want to add as we mentioned a third film's being confirmed is actually part two retitled as spider-man beyond the spider-verse and the spin-off with spider-woman is also in the works with lauren montgomery in the talks to direct it Ooh, cool. and in may of this year it was announced that there's going to be a manga spin-off called oh. spider-man octopus girl what written by haruyuki oh. furuhashi and illustrated by betancourt from going to oh, vigilantes, and will begin wow. serialization this year in Shueisha Shonen Jump. So we got a lot to look forward to coming wow. into play with it's this particular franchise live action, right? Spider Man. So if you've watched either Into the Spider Verse or Across the Spider Verse, let us know in the comments below. If you haven't and you haven't watched either movie, you are missing out on top tier entertainment. And having some of the most fun in your life watching Spider-Man movies and some of the best Sony movies made to date. Yes. And if you haven't, they're available every well, the first movie is available everywhere. The second one will be out soon, but you can still stream it, watch it, come back and let us know what you think. Right. And if you haven't already subscribed for updates to weekly videos in your favorite anime series, anime shows, and all things animation, and Spider-Man. Yes, and last but not least, if you want to hear more of Playmakers theories and information on uh, the Spider-Verse movies, let us know in the comments below and we will record another one because we know this isn't the end of it. Is it, Playmaker? Oh, oh no. no <laughs> right. So let us know in the comments below. And if you haven't visited Playmaker's channel, yeah, definitely check it out. He's got lots and lots of stuff, not just for Spider-Marco, but also 
uh, Powerpuff Girls, Spider-Man, just Star vs. Evil itself. Even faith-based content that yes. you'll enjoy and be marveled by. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for joining us. We've really enjoyed this. We've learned so much. And this discourse is being fantastic. And we hope that they want to hear more and we'll get to do a second one. Right. So, thank you so much for watching, guys. I'm Esther Entertainment. And I'm Mama Entertainment. And... This is Playmaker. Have a tune-tastic day. Peace.